Hey everyone, this lesson is on Raynaud's phenomenon or Raynaud's syndrome. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about what this condition is. We're also gonna talk about what are some of the risk factors and associated conditions with regards to this phenomenon. We're also gonna talk about why this occurs and we're also gonna talk about how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So Raynaud's phenomenon is essentially an excessive and abnormal vasoconstriction to emotional stress and or cold temperatures. So here is a picture of a Raynaud's phenomenon occurring where you can see some of the digits on the hand becoming very pale. So the estimated prevalence of Raynaud's phenomenon is about three to 20% in females and three to 14% in males. So it's quite varied. And the, the issue is, is that some of the diagnostic criteria differ between different areas and because of the fact that many of these individuals might not present to the healthcare system. When Raynaud's does occur, it has an onset that occurs early in life. Some of the risk factors for Raynaud's includes the following. Being female has a higher likelihood of having Raynaud's phenomenon compared to males, as we can see in the estimated prevalences. Being younger, so we talked about an onset occurring in early life. Being younger seems to be a risk factor for having Raynaud's phenomenon. A family history, so individuals with other family members with Raynaud's have a higher likelihood of having Raynaud's themselves. Non-African descent individuals seem to be at a higher likelihood or a higher risk of having Raynaud's phenomenon as individuals of African descent have estimated prevalences on the lower end of the range, so around 3%. So I add geography here as well. Geography is not a risk factor as much as it is an influencing factor. So individuals that live in colder climates will have a larger or more exaggerated or more frequent presentation of Raynaud's phenomenon due to cold temperatures being one of the triggers for this condition. Risk factors as well include associated conditions, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So what is the pathophysiology of Raynaud's? I mentioned that it is an exaggerated response to cold temperatures and stress, but the fact is, is that vasoconstriction to cold temperatures and stress is a normal physiologic function that is there to help conserve body heat. But as we mentioned before, Raynaud's phenomenon represents an exaggerated or an excessive response to these normal conditions. So cold temperature stress can lead to an exaggerated response in individuals with Raynaud's phenomenon. So what we see is that cold temperatures, emotional stress can be other triggers as well. We'll talk about more about those in the next couple of slides. These can lead to vasoconstriction in a normal individual. So we see here normal amounts of vasoconstriction. But with Raynaud's, this response is exaggerated. It is excessive. It essentially, you can think of it as squeezing off the arterial or the vasculature so much that you can get very little blood coming in. And this is the essentially the issue in Raynaud's is that because of this excessive vasoconstriction, we're not able to get enough blood to the extremities, especially the digits, fingers, toes. And this is what leads to some of the signs and symptoms we'll talk about in the next couple of slides as well. So before I move on, I wanna talk about types of Raynaud's. Types of Raynaud's include primary versus secondary Raynaud's. Primary Raynaud's is essentially idiopathic. There are no known underlying causes for the Raynaud's phenomenon. Onset of primary Raynaud's occurs early on in life between the ages of 15 and 30. And young women are more likely to have primary Raynaud's. And the condition may be associated with fibromyalgia. This evidence is still up for debate. Now with regards to secondary Raynaud's, secondary Raynaud's means that it's secondary to something else. It's due to an underlying condition. There's many conditions that can cause secondary Raynaud's phenomenon or secondary Raynaud's syndrome. So one of the biggest categories that causes secondary Raynaud's is autoimmune conditions. So conditions like scleroderma. Scleroderma is actually the most common cause of secondary Raynaud's. SLE or lupus and Sjogren's syndrome are also other conditions that can cause secondary Raynaud's. Hematologic conditions can also do this as well. Cryoglobulinemia, perineal plastic syndromes, and Poems syndrome all can lead to secondary Raynaud's as well. Hypothyroidism can cause secondary Raynaud's. Other vascular diseases can cause Raynaud's like atherosclerosis, vasculitis, emboli, thromboangiitis, obliterans, and thoracic outlet syndrome. Carpal tunnel can also cause secondary Raynaud's as well as other neurologic conditions that are expressed in the hand. All of these can lead to abnormal vasoconstriction responses. Drugs are also a major category in the cause of secondary Raynaud's. Some of these drugs include the following, cocaine, nicotine, so smoking, interferons, sympathomimetics, ergotamines, bleomycin. So bleomycin and cisplatin are both chemotherapy drugs. So chemotherapies themselves can cause secondary Raynaud's and beta blockers also can cause secondary Raynaud's 
Raynaud's or exacerbate an underlying Raynaud's already. So these are very important to recognize and remember. Autoimmune hepatitis can also lead to a secondary Raynaud's and diabetes mellitus can also exacerbate an underlying Raynaud's. So a way to remember the categories of causes or diagnoses that cause Raynaud's, we can think of the mnemonic cold hand. So cold hand is a way to remember. So C for cryoglobulinemia, O for obstruction, so you think of emboli in this case, L for lupus or other connective tissue diseases, D for diabetes and drugs, we mentioned in the last slide, H for hematological conditions, we talked about that as well, a for arterial conditions like atherosclerosis, N for neurological conditions, and D for essentially don't know. And this is the kind of catch-all category for idiopathic. And this is the primary Raynaud's. So this is the mnemonic in order to help us remember some of the causes of Raynaud's. Cold hand, C for cryoglobulinemia, O for obstruction, L for lupus, D for diabetes and drugs, H for hematologic conditions, a for atherosclerosis or arterial conditions, N for neurological conditions, and D for don't know, which is the idiopathic or primary Raynaud's category. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of Raynaud's? Some of the signs and symptoms of Raynaud's are due to Raynaud attacks, and we're gonna talk about what a Raynaud attack is. Raynaud attacks are a change in coloration of the hand in response to cold exposure or stress. So what we see is at least two color changes that are well demarcated in digits. So fingers, toes, other parts of the body, we'll talk about other areas of the body that can be affected in a bit. So the first color is pallor. So pale, paleness, and this is what we call the white attack. The second color is cyanosis, and this is the blue attack. So essentially, you can see here, the fingers are well demarcated, they're very white, pale, and then after, they can become blue cyanotic in color. And the blue attack represents the ischemic phase. Because of that excessive vasoconstriction we talked about earlier, there's not enough blood getting to the tissue, it can cause ischemia, so hypoxia. And the third color that we may see is erythema. So this is due to reperfusion, it's a stage of reperfusion after these other two stages before. So pallor, cyanosis, and then we can get a reperfusion after where it can become very erythematous, so very red. These Raynaud attacks have a sudden onset. They come on very quickly in response to a trigger. The episode themselves lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. An episode will generally start in one finger and then spreads symmetrically in both hands. And the index, middle, and ring fingers are the most commonly affected fingers, whereas the thumb is often spared. But if you do see the thumb being affected with a Raynaud attack, it can often be a sign that it is a secondary Raynaud's cause. Other symptoms include paresthesia, so pins and needles sensation in the fingers, and numbness, and reduced finger coordination because of the paresthesias and numbness. And patients with Raynaud's will also have aching or pain in their fingers due to that ischemia as well. And what tends to occur is that the symptoms of Raynaud's are often worse in secondary Raynaud's as compared to primary Raynaud's. So some other signs and symptoms of Raynaud's include the following. Cutaneous vasospasm can occur in other areas of the body. So that blanching, that pallor, and the cyanosis can occur in other parts of the body other than the fingers and toes. We can see this happen in nose, ears, and face. We may also see what is called levito reticularis. Levito reticularis is this webbing pattern we see on the skin, and we can see this in the hands, we can see this in other parts of the body as well. So I'm gonna also talk about some of the triggers of a Raynaud attack. Some of the triggers include cold temperatures, as we mentioned before. Stress is also a major trigger as well, due to the catecholamines and causing vasoconstriction. And vibration can also be a trigger. So vibration or any other kind of trauma on the hands can lead to a Raynaud attack in a subset of individuals. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat Raynaud's? The diagnosis of Raynaud's is not very straightforward. There's no well-defined gold standard diagnostic test. We have to diagnose Raynaud's based on history. So we ask the question, do your fingers change color when they are exposed to cold temperatures? Are the color changes well demarcated? And are there multiple colors? Are they white, blue, or both? If they say no to both these questions, we can essentially rule out the diagnosis of Raynaud's. If they answer yes to both of these questions, we can make the diagnosis of Raynaud's. We may also want to assess for other associated conditions and causes to assess, is this a primary or is this a secondary cause of Raynaud's? And we can also do what is called a nail fold capillary microscopy. This is not very frequently used, but this can help distinguish between primary and secondary Raynaud's. 
once we have made the diagnosis of Raynaud's, how do we treat it? So we can use conservative methods. We can try to avoid some of those triggers we talked about earlier. So avoid cold temperatures, some of the provoking medications like beta blockers. We also want to avoid smoking because of that nicotine component. And we also want to avoid trauma with regards to vibration induced Raynaud's. We also want to reduce stress as well, as we know stress can also be a trigger. With regards to primary Raynaud's, we can try to be more conservative as primary Raynaud's may have spontaneous remission. And if the conservative methods haven't worked, it haven't really helped with the signs and symptoms of Raynaud's, we can use pharmacological treatments. Some of these include dihydropyridine, calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, nifedipine. We may also use phosphodesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil. We can also use topical nitrates. Topical nitrates are generally used for limited Raynaud's. We can also use angiotensin receptor blockers like losartan. And we may also use selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine. So if you want to learn more about other associated associated conditions that cause Raynaud's, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing and clicking the notification bell. It helps support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you next time.